Welcome everyone uh, to the final art and politics lecture series of this semester. I'm Jeremy, um, the director of the honors program. Uh, nice to see you all this evening. Um, first of all, before we get going with our ceremonies, uh, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, give like a moment of recognition and thanks to Juliet, who has been uh, a uh, sort of atlas holding up the lecture series for the last two years um, and is about to graduate. So uh, yeah, if we maybe, I don't know, give her a quiet Zoom hand and or just generally uh, say excellent things about her because she is a fantastic artist and human being. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you, Julia. Well, it's been a pleasure, um, thank you. Uh, so um, without more, much more ado, uh, let me just say a couple things about what we do, what the lecture series is about, and then I will turn it over to our guest of honor. Uh, the Art and Politics Lecture Series is uh, formulated to think about what art and general uh, humanistic inquiry have to say in light of the urgent, nay, catastrophic situations confronting humanity. Um, I, you know, the funny thing about talking about catastrophe is I've been doing it for a while. Um, some year has too, I know, but it's like it, every year it seems to get a little truer, <laughs> which uh, you always, you know, you always hope in the back of your mind sometimes with concepts that they'll get a little less true over time. Um, uh, but this one, this one kind of goes right to the heart of it. Um, so obviously we're living in the middle of uh, a public health crisis. Um, we've been through an economic crisis. We've been through uh, crises of racial justice. We've been through crises and we're living through uh, more epochally a crisis of the climate um, and so many other things. And the Art and Politics Lecture Series is here to ask urgent questions during that time. Um, so uh, that's what we do. Um, we will be taking our summer hiatus after this uh, lecture, but stay tuned for an announcement sometime over the summer of our lineup for next year um, as we continue to uh, try to provide a space for engagement, for ideas, and for thinking about the things that need to be thought about. Um, so uh, then without further ado, let me introduce uh, Samir Gandesha, who I'm so honored to have with us. Um, he's the director of the Institute for Humanities, uh, at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Um, his most recent volume is uh, Specters of Fascism, Historical, Theoretical, and International Perspectives. And he's written widely on, uh, in a whole number of publications on uh, Adorno's aesthetics, on politics, um, on critical theory, uh, and other things, Marx uh, and Arendt, and other things that he can remind me of. Um, he, I've had the privilege of hearing many talks for Samir um, and uh, from Samir and enjoying them immensely and always finding them quite stimulating and uh, reflection invoking. And so uh, we're really honored to have him here with us tonight and I will give the floor to him. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, um, for that, uh, that, that wonderful flattering um, uh, introduction uh, and, and also for the invitation to be part of this uh, illustrious lecture series um thanks for organizing it and and uh um having me here um thank you also uh to juliet for uh for the work you've done in in putting it together um i would also uh before i begin like to acknowledge that I, i'm speaking um from the unceded territory of the musqueam um uh, peoples uh, i think this is always important for us to recognize uh insofar as um in in some ways uh countries like canada the united states Australia, New Zealand, and, and so on, like to think of themselves as, um, in a sense, having uh, overcome their settler colonial history. Uh, but um, we need to always remember that we're part of a kind of ongoing settler colonialism that has to be uh, transformed. I mean, this is a, a big question for us in, uh, in Canada today. So um, this is important to recognize. So uh, I'd like to, to get straight into uh, to the talk, uh, which really is um, quite exploratory in, in nature. It, it uh, is something like um, some reflections that will go into a, 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 a research proposal and, and hopefully will become a book at, at, at some point in, in, in the future. Um, think if I had had 
a, a bit more time if this semester hadn't been so um, so scattered for me, uh, I would have, uh, particularly for this audience, put um, uh, Jacques Louis uh, David very much at the center of the of the talk. Uh, not just uh, because of the importance of the uh, the death of Marat, uh, but also, of course, the, um, the death of Socrates. Uh, and I think that um, these paintings are, are, are really important for, um, in a sense, disclosing some of the, the, the key themes that, that I want to talk about uh, today. Um, I mean, the, the first is, of course, the, the, the originary trauma of Western philosophy, which is the death of Socrates and then, and then uh, Plato's response to it. And, and I think in um, his eight, 1787 painting, um, uh, uh, David really shows this. It's, it, it's a kind of dream. It's a P Plato's dream uh, or nightmare of, uh, of the, the, uh, the death of Socrates by way of Hemlock. Um, this is on the eve of the, the French Revolution, of course. It's just two years ahead. Uh, and that in, an, in and of itself plays such a key role in uh, the development of uh, German idealism. Uh, German idealism really tries to respond to the dislocations, uh, the, um, uh, the profound um, uh, uh, fractures of the, the French Revolution and, and ultimately in Hegel to try and heal these, uh, these uh, directions. Uh, so it's very much at the center of, uh, of, of his project and of course, the, um, the whole problem of Socratism, the whole problem of Socratic philosophy is there uh, in Nietzsche, but of course, Heidegger. And I think with Heidegger, you have something very interesting insofar as on the one hand, there's an attempt to reach back before uh, the Socratics to the pre-Socratics and these originary Greek experiences that he wants to uh, return to. But then there's also, on the other hand, in his, uh, uh, his notorious, uh, Rectorat's uh, Rede, the, the um, rectoral address in, in 1933, you have a, a direct attempt to um, interpret the uh, Republic and make it available for the, the project of uh, Gleichschaltung, the, the kind of total coordination of, of the Nazi state. So there's a, a, a kind of deep implication of the relationship between uh, modernity, fascism, and philosophy. These are big, big claims. But these are intuitions that I have that could be unearthed further uh, by taking very seriously this, this question of trauma and its role and, and the way it reverberates throughout uh, the philosophical tradition. Um, so that, that's really what I would have liked to have done in more detail to get things going. But those are just some reflections off the top. So now I'm going to get into the paper, which I have presented in different uh, forms elsewhere. And as I said, there are reflections towards something like a proposal for a further research. So I'm extremely keen. I mean, everybody says this, don't they? Uh, I'd really like to hear what you have to say. But in this case, I really mean it. Uh, I, I'd like to hear uh, what you, you think about this as a kind of viable project to um, revisit uh, and throw in a different light the history of, of, of political uh, theory. And there is, uh, you know, throughout it, um, uh, references to uh, questions of art and aesthetics. So there, that, that hasn't been, in a sense, allowed to uh, drop away. Uh, but it's, I think, and, and hopefully interwoven into the text. So let me begin uh, now for those prefatory remarks. Leisure, argued Thomas Hobbes, is the mother of philosophy. But is this really true? The proposition seems to contradict Hobbes' own experience. His most famous book, Leviathan, in which he portrays life within the state of nature as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and justifies obedience to the absolute state, was far from being a product of leisure. Leviathan was written at the conclusion of the English Civil War, which stretched between 1642 and 1651, and was deeply shaped by the fear that Hobbes had himself experienced during this tumultuous period of English history. Hobbes even took direct aim at the quintessential philosophy of leisure, which was um, that of Plato's most illustrious student, Aristotle, which defines the good life as a life devoted to quiet contemplation. Yet even Aristotle's arist aristocratic pathos of distance that apparently serves as a condition for the possibility of such philosophy um, as such is marked by a darker, unconscious and traumatic history 
not unlike the events that so shook Hobbes, and I'll, I'll come back to this. In his project of engaging in a destruction of uh, the history of Western metaphysics in Sein und Zeit, Being in Time, Martin Heidegger proposes to bring thinking back to those primordial Greek experiences of being that were, in his view, immediately blocked and covered over by metaphysics's forgetfulness of being, Sein's Vergessenheit, in its positing of the opposition between being and time. He sought to show, in contrast, that the being of the human being was of a different order than mere entities. The situated human being, Dasein, was fundamentally constituted by, rather than to be understood as antithetical to, temporality, and was oriented to her, most, her, her own most possibility, which is to say, death. In seeking to take philosophy back to the primal Greek experiences of being, Heidegger can be taken to as referring here to Socrates' claim in Plato's Theotetus that philosophy begins in Thomitzein, or wonder, at being, in its temporal play of aletheia, or simultaneous concealment and disclosure of beings. In his phenomenological analysis of the tool in being in time, Heidegger shows the way in which the Cartesian cogito ergo sum stands on its head. In place of the cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, Heidegger shows that I am thrown there into a world and therefore I think. Yet the activity of thinking in the Cartesian sense is not normative, but a product of breakdown and crisis. Typically, we use tools to accomplish certain tasks within the context of a world comprised of pre-given meanings. Heidegger's example is a hammer. Working on projects discloses the nature of the situated human being, Dasein, uh, which is understood as temporal, that is, as always already anticipating a future uh, out of past activities and commitments. Within this temporally oriented meaningful activity or work, the tool is understood as an extension of the hand, indeed the body. The tool is, as Heidegger says, Zuhanden, or ready to hand, and its objecthood or independent being disappears as a separate discrete entity as we continue to work um, with it in our projects, which are also temporal projections insofar as they're oriented to completion in some as yet undetermined future. In the event that the tool breaks down, it undergoes a kind of gestalt shift. Its being is no longer disclosed as zuhanden, but rather forehanden. It becomes transformed as something ready to hand that is alongside to something that is present, ha present at hand, something standing in front of us. It is at this moment that we have a disembodied, de-worlded subject confronting an equally de-worlded object. Phenomenologically speaking, the origin of the kojito premised upon the radical split between subject and object is an effect of breakdown. It's an effect of breakdown, which is to say trauma. Again, philosophy evinces not a wondrous, but a traumatic origin. And I'll return to this again. The COVID-19 pandemic um, brings into view the relation between trauma, which undoubtedly has been induced around the world, in terms of individual and public, physical and mental health, social relations, forms of governance, and the economy on the one hand, and the nature of thinking on the other. The global pandemic has exposed deep fractures in the neoliberal social order. The COVID-19 virus is a kind of poison. The German word for poison is das Gift. Switching between the German and English denotations brings to mind the close associations between the two meanings that also suggests the, the Greek word um, didonai, to give, and dosis, gift, the, the root word, um, the root of the English word dose, signifying something that is given. The COVID-19 virus can be regarded as a dose of poison, das gift, a kind of offering or gift. The gift-like quality of COVID-19 is that it shifts our perspective and brings to light what otherwise would have remained hidden or occluded. Remember Freud, 
traveling on the ship to the United States to deliver lectures at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, remarking to Jung, quote, we are bringing them the plague and they don't even know it. So here we see that if knowledge, in this case, the knowledge of the unconscious is like a plague, then the plague, in this case, of course, COVID-19, can be the source of terrible new knowledge. Or we could say with Otto Rank, that if birth is the basic ontological trauma endured by human beings, then trauma itself can birth new ways of thinking about the world. And didn't Socrates himself have no teaching to offer, but rather sought to engage in philosophy as a kind of practice, as a kind of meutics or midwifery, rather than system building on uh, firm foundations. COVID-19 can be regarded then as a gift that helps us to reframe the history of philosophy, uh, which has been famously understood by Richard Rorty, himself drawing upon the conservative English philosopher Michael Oakeshott, as a kind of conversation of mankind. And one can read any number of histories of political thought that understand these histories in terms of so many conversations between great thinkers, as if all that were at stake were what Karl Popper uh, called uh, conjecture and refutation, attempts to falsify hypotheses of one's opponents, criticism, arguments, and counter arguments, conceptual revolutions, and categorical distinctions. If the metaphor of conversation is fitting, then it is a conversation marked by parapraxies, repetitions, breaks, and ultimately incoherence. It is precisely this kind of trauma that Freud referred to when he described psychoanalysis uh, as following on the heels of the Copernican and Darwinian revolutions in science. At the end of the 18th of 28 lectures delivered uh, between uh, 1915 and 1917 and published in 1920 in English as a general introduction to psychoanalysis, um, Freud goes into detail uh, in, uh, um, to, to explain the consequences of these three decenterings. I won't uh, go into the quotes, a long one. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that most people are familiar with, uh, with Freud um, uh, on this score. And if, if not, we can certainly come back to it in the discussion. Perhaps it's most important moments or when this conversion, so if we're thinking about conversation as marked by these, uh, these interruptions, um, perhaps it's most important moments are when this conversation is marked by aphasia or certain cessation or par paralysis of speech itself. Um, that is a symptom of trauma. The Vedic text that serves as a cor cornerstone to Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita, which came to be book six of the sprawling Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata, over several times as long as the Odyssey and Iliad combined, begins at the site of a battlefield in the ongoing war between two families, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. The hero of the epic, Arjuna, is paralyzed at the prospect of the death and destruction of his friends and relations, um, and seems unable to do his duty and fight according to his dharma. It is Arjuna's own paralysis that occasions Krishna's speech, and this is the eponymous Bhagavad Gita, the song of God, that begins with the immortality of the soul, being, and the transitory, transitory nature of the body, and provides insight into the nature of the interrelationship between dharma, or duty, karma, fate, and nirvana, transcendence. Trauma, then, can be understood as shaking the foundations of what Thomas Kuhn called normal science, which is to say that the taken for granted assumptions and beliefs that constitute uh, a worldview or can say a life world. Um, for example, that the universe uh, uh, is centered on the earth. Galileo's discovery of the moons of Jupiter were key evidence that could no longer be squared with this paradigm, with the geocentric paradigm, and therefore inaugurated uh, what Kuhn called revolutionary science. Trauma here can be understood as a form of historical caesura, as noted by Theodore W. Adorno when he in Negative Dialectics writes that Hitler has occasioned a new categorical imperative to organize our thoughts and actions in such a way that the Holocaust never repeat itself. 
Hasn't COVID-19 shattered our world in a similar way? Trauma, in other words, is as Hal Foster frames it in Lacanian terms, the return of the real. The return of the real doesn't, of course, mean the return to a brute, brute reality understood in pre-critical terms, pre-Kantian terms. Um, that is that it can be uh, directly or empirically apprehended by the senses, but rather a deep laceration in the symbolic order. The return of the real is akin to being rendered speechless by a phenomenon or an event. It can be likened to the sublime, which according to Kant was that which we can conceive but are unable to represent. Montaigne presents us with an excellent example of this in his essay uh, on sadness. I, I won't quote that right now for, for uh, time uh, constraints. Edmund Burke understood the French Revolution as manifesting the logic of the sublime in contradiction, contradistinction to the beauty of the glorious English Revolution of 1688. For Burke, the terrible sublimity of the French Revolution in part lay in its violation of the natural order. Entailing inter alia, the Jacobins' symbolic murder of King Louis uh, XVI and the rape of Marie Antoinette. If Burke believed that the French Revolution ought to be contested and reversed indeed, out of a fear that it may spread to Britain and Ireland, then Hegel thought that philosophy comes specifically on the scene, uh, on the scene to heal the deremptions or tears, the, the Rissenheiten, that it opened up in the world, that the French Revolution opened up in the world. While Hegel will later turn such thinking into a theodicy or the negation of the negativity of evil in a divinely created world, Adorno unearths the traumatic kernel of Hegel's philosophizing brought to head in Marx's Das Kapital as what Adorno calls in negative dialectics, the phenomenology of the anti-spirit. Universal history is therefore not the progressive realization of a genuinely human ethical form of life, Sittlichkeit, but rather its opposite. Hegel's theodicy entails a logic whose telos is not the plenitude of spirit, the fulfillment of spirit, but its abjection, as signified um, by Samuel Beckett's post-apocalyptic bunker in Endgame, inhabited in a proleptic, one could argue, depiction of social isolationism by Clove, Ham, and his elderly parents, who are themselves, again, uh, rather prophetically, confined to garbage cans. Everyone across the globe now is wondering whether COVID-19 is not in fact the end game of universal history in the, in the guise of neoliberal globalization. COVID-19 therefore undoubtedly constitutes a crisis and the word crisis, it is important to remember and I think people uh, may be familiar with this as well. It derives from the Greek krisis, meaning decision, uh, and the Greek word krinine, to decide. In the late Middle Ages, uh, the word comes uh, to mean the turning point of a disease, that decisive point at which the condition of the patient manifestly improves or deteriorates. Today, perhaps reverting unconsciously to this particular sense of the word crisis, when we obsessively swipe up on our uh, smartphones for reports of current global, the, cur the current status of the, the spread of the pandemic, we, we wonder is the curve on the upswing or the downswing? In the phrase unknown about a year ago, but now ubiquitous and inescapable, are we by isolating ourselves from one another, like Ham's unhappy family, flattening the curve? The crisis also has to do with the nature of our neoliberal capitalist social relations. Can we ever go back to the previous normal, the status quo ante? But was that normal ever really even normal? Ah, the good old days, sighs Ham's mother. This was, we must remember, a post-human world in which human beings were quickly becoming posthumous, which is to say increasingly obsolete. Here the refugee is a very figure of human disposability is truly what Anna Arendt calls the vanguard of her people. Edward Said writes, quote, the novelty of our time 
to which New York gives special emphasis, is that so many individuals have experienced the uprooting and dislocations that have made them expatriates and exiles. Out of such travail, there comes an urgency, not to say a precariousness of vision and a tentativeness of statement that renders the use of language something much more interesting and provisional than it otherwise would be. Isn't the logic of the virus at some level simply an extension and a deepening of the logic of um, that world rather than a qualitative break from it? What now must change? Key to understanding this crisis as a crisis, which is to say as a moment of decision, though one would hope without decisionism, a la Carl Schmitt, is the extent to which our own traumatic present reveals what Adorno called the primacy of the object, or as alluded to above in a Lacanian register, the anxiety provoking real, that the integrity of my finite abject, possibly infected though asymptomatic vulnerable body is inextricable from the integrity of those around me, both in my immediate vicinity, no less than on continents far, far away. Viral pandemics such as COVID-19 and the climate um, crisis from which they are inextricable know no borders. The well-being and indeed thriving of my body is contingent upon the well-being of non-human animal species and the ecosystems they inhabit and constitute. In contrast to the amazement of the existence of why there is something rather than nothing, the gift of Das Gift can be regarded then as a kind of brutal lesson in universalism. It discloses what could be called a negative humanism grounded not in an ontology or essence of the human or a mystical sending of being, ego autonomy or will to power, but in this inescapable universalism of a trembling fragility, fragility and profound vulnerability to suffering. And ultimately, to that final end game, death itself. Thank you. Thank you. So for people who are new to what we're up to, uh, how we do this, I'll ask uh, a question or two of Samir just to kind of get us warmed up. Um, and then when uh, people are welcome to get in line, we'll have time for a little Q and A. Um, you just write stack in the chat, like I'm writing right now. And then um, when it's your go, I'll make sure to unmute you so you can participate. Um, so feel free to get on stack at any point. Um, yeah, thank you, Samir. That is quite exploratory uh, and I think really interesting. I mean, I guess you're, you're in some ways you're basically asking like uh, whether and how COVID will be a crisis um, will it be something, and, and to some degree that that is determined by the future, um, not so much by the present or the past, um, that is kind of a, uh, something in process. Um, and I guess my own, uh, I, I, I feel like I felt that way for the first few months, but I become over time more and more skeptical that much has fundamentally changed. Um, we had a speaker on uh, David Dayan months and months ago, who mentioned, you know, that COVID in some ways has exacerbated um, so much of what was most deleterious about our society, the social isolation, the corporate monopolization and concentration, the inequality, the, uh, um, uh, the inequality like class, racial, all around the, um, yeah, so I'm curious what what you think, if you agree with that assessment, if you think I'm being too pessimistic. So that was one question I had. Then the other question I have is this idea of philosophy and trauma. That seems right to me, but I wonder in terms of what philosophy does with trauma, it seems philosophy is often trying to like, as it were, um, is not reaching the kind of negative universalism you mentioned at the end. Usually philosophy, say Hobbes, Plato, and many of the others you mentioned, kind of going the other way and it's like, oh God, keep me away from that rabble. Um, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens back when he was good, 
uh, wrote, uh, wrote a review of Isaiah Berlin, which is really wonderful. And he mentions an incident of Isaiah Berlin's childhood where Berlin sees um, a, a mob kind of overcome a policeman in Russia. And he mentions how this is like very influential for uh, Berlin mentions that it's very influential for his development and this kind of horror at seeing the mob do this. And his, Hitchens has this kind of funny take where he's like, you wonder, or actually you don't wonder so much if he would have felt the same way if it had been a whole bunch of policemen who had, you know, shot at, killed the mob, i.e. it was the upsetting of the order that was so traumatic for Berlin and set him on the philosophical path, not so much the daily way in which the order reproduces itself and in which injustice kind of reigns. Um, so I wonder just how that affects, I mean, you mentioned that briefly too about Burke and others, but I wonder how that affects, that philosophy is often basically trying to some degree to restore a world pre-trauma rather than to actually, uh, you know, recognize the realities uh, introduced, say, the actually existing injustice in the world by these traumatic moments that you point to. Those were my initial two questions. I don't know. Oh, great. Well, there's, there's a lot there uh, to discuss. First of all, um, I would totally agree with you that, uh, you know, our, our, our sort of post-COVID world or the world, you know, uh, that we inhabit under COVID certainly has, has magnified um, the uh, various inequities and injustices um, that uh, were, were present uh, prior uh, to the pandemic, uh, really worse than them. And, and you look at the the, the, the fortunes of um, Jeff Bezos, for example, and Amazon. I mean, uh, he's profited enormously uh, from, uh, from the crisis. Uh, on, on the other side, on the, the other end, you, you look at the way in which it's um, predominantly um, the, the most vulnerable people, racialized people, uh, uh, women um, who have been uh, most exposed to infection, um, right? And so, I think that that can then be an, an opportunity for thinking uh, otherwise about our social relations. Whether that opportunity will be seized upon or not is is the question. Nothing is uh, uh, is is settled in advance, right? And and I think that this project would be, in a sense, a, an intervention to really, uh, first of all, think about how trauma has played a role in philosophy historically, um, a role that hasn't really been um, given an, very much attention. So what happens if we put trauma at, at the, the forefront of our understanding of the emergence of, of philosophy, um, its continued practice, and in particular, political philosophy? Uh, and then I think you do get into these questions of, uh, of let's say, revolution versus restoration, right? Um, but I think it's, it, I, I start with Hobbes because it's such an interesting case insofar as he is a, quite a revolutionary thinker, right? Um, uh, you know, taking aim at, um, at Aristotelian metaphysics, taking aim at scholasticism, developing a new, new theory of signs and, and a, full go, a, a thoroughgoing account of, of nominalism. I think he's, he's hugely important from that standpoint. And he's also theorizing a new, providing a new kind of philosophical um, legitimation or apologia for uh, for absolutism. So he's not just he's not a restorationist in that sense. Uh, he's a real theorist of the modern state. So trauma is a provocation for him to do this. But he says it's born of leisure. So I think this is interesting that philosophy is born of leisure. I find this interesting. Um, there's an attempted forgetting right of the traumatic origins of, of philosophy itself. Um, I mean, it, it's it's clearly laid out in, in the platonic dialogues. But how many I mean, how much attention is devoted to that and what implications or what inferences are drawn from, from that experience? I think that um, uh, deserves further uh, discussion. And then of course, it's Adorno who, who really plays a key role in, um, in inspiring the, the project insofar as it's the césure of, you know, of, of the 20th century um, of the Holocaust. Um, but let's also remember that when Adorno uh, addresses the need to uh, address the past, work through the, the, the past, um, he doesn't just talk about the Holocaust, he talks about the, uh, the uh, Armenian um, genocide as well. 
So he doesn't fetishize that historical event. And I think this is really important. Uh, he wants to suggest that the, the, you know, the, the dialectic of enlightenment um, is catastrophic in, in, in a fuller uh, sense. And that then um, presents philosophy with a new set of tasks, right? The new categorical imperative must be taken with the utmost seriousness. And I think this is an attempt to really allow trauma, the trauma of history, to reverberate um, in, uh, in, in philosophical concepts. And, and that's, that's what interests me. And so if we take that as a premise and then go back and look at, at the, 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 the history of philosophy per se, then I think interesting insights can be generated. At least that's my intuition. It, it, as, you know, as you noted, um, sort of reiterating what I said at the beginning, this is exploratory. Um, and that's why it sort of moves around and you know, it uh, is, is not a, a systematic paper, but more some reflections. But I think that's my intuition that if we, if we place trauma right at the, the forefront, then, then I think we, we um, uh, can generate some interesting insights. I'd also say that Alan Ryan and Hannah Arendt and others have drawn attention to the the importance of the death of, of Socrates for Plato. I, this is nothing new for me, um, but it's just how can we put that in, in conversation with other, um, let's say other developments. Yeah, it occurs to me, um, I'm gonna go to the stack in a second, but the last thing I'd say to that is, um, you know, to the tie with Adorno also might bring us back to art in a way, because Adorno, you know, I mean, to some degree, as I understand his fundamental definition of art is art at its best, let suffering speak. Um, and so to some degree, uh, that may be where sort of a critical philosophy and art might be allied in what you're trying to point to here. And it's in a certain kind of relationship to um, trauma, disaster, injustice. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, and my kind of oblique references to Endgame uh, were pointing in that direction. Um, uh, not only is Schoenberg and, you know, the, the second Viennese school so important, to Adorno, but but Beckett is hugely important, and and reading Endgame again today is quite uncanny. You know, it really is. It's 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 about COVID, you could say, right? So yeah, several several of the students in this group have actually read it with me. So um, yeah. uh, okay, I'm going to go to the stack. I see Lynn. I'm going to attempt to unmute you, Lynn. Can you unmute? I'm just going to say just the distinction. Uh, if we're talking about the virus and climate change. You know, j just the distinction between the human element in it, which is the political, okay? And then there's the natural element. Mm -hmm. I mean, the virus doesn't care and, and climate change doesn't care about us. You know, it's gonna, ha it's gonna go on without us. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, pointing, pointing out that distinction um, as, as far as how to think about the philosophical as opposed to the natural. I, right. I, don't, I don't have any conclusion. I'm, I'm just um, I'm just bringing this up. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I see these as as inextricably tied uh, together. Um, so COVID has been uh, it, it has been argued has to do with amongst other things uh, the destruction of. Uh, um, ecological systems through, you know, human incursion, um, through the development uh, uh, of uh, uh, um, human social relations through capital accumulation, uh, right? And, and that's the same thing that's driving uh, the climate crisis. Um, so it's, it's about the interaction between subject and objects. It's about the interaction between um, human beings, human societies, human social forms, and the natural world. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, analytically, we have to make some distinctions in terms of what you said. I mean, you know, the virus doesn't, in a, in a sense, care about what it is in, you know, how it is repro reproducing itself, um, unless it, you could say that it cares uh, to do so as efficiently as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, the the, the, the key thing is that we have to understand these phenomena is, is profoundly inter, intertwined, you know. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, uh, well, I just wanted to read one thing that was in the chat and then we'll come to Ian who's next. 
Um, so Brian mentioned, just, I was curious if you had any thoughts about this, um, Samir. He says, it's impossible for us to predict how this will play out. We're in the midst of a storm. It takes a while for a work of art to come to completion. Um, look at how the AIDS pandemic affected philosophy and art. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I think that there, there is a tendency for, for people to, to try and rush analyses uh, uh, you know, to try and come to grips with something that is uh, still as yet quite undetermined and undeterminable as a result. Uh, but at the same time, I, I take it not as the central object uh, of, of my, uh, my interest here, but rather a kind of provocation, right? The, the, the trauma is interesting uh, because it's, it's fully global. It unites us in the same way that climate uh, change does, uh, perhaps more so, more so, because I think that the um, you know, the, the, the wealthy nations of the North can um, ignore climate change to uh, an extent that, say, countries like Bangladesh cannot, right? There's an immediacy uh, of climate change that seems to be happening now as opposed to in 15 years, right? Whereas the pandemic is a little bit different. There's a certain immediacy to it as a global phenomenon. I think this is really fascinating, right? Um, but absolutely, we, we don't know where it's gonna end up. I mean, the fact that there, there are these variants of concern that are circulating and, and mutations constantly are happening, it's, it's a truly scary uh, situation that we find ourselves in. But it's, for me, a provocation to think uh, a, a, about trauma, yeah. But thank you, thank you for the comment. And I hope uh, on that, I hope the internationalism that you're speaking of, which I think, yeah, is clearly apparent, comes through uh, over intellectual property rights, because um, I do think that's right. one of the current big conflicts. I was just speaking to a friend of mine in South Africa today, and I was like, oh, so have you been vaccinated yet? He's like, vaccinated? <laughs> there aren't any of those here. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, for the, for the global north, um, it's, it's a matter of enlightened self-interest, isn't it? Uh, you know, everybody needs to uh, to be vaccinated for everybody to be safe at the end of the day. Um, one could argue. Yeah. Uh, Ian, go ahead. I actually had two questions. Um, kind of more of a micro question, more of a macro question. Um, on a micro level, like on a very specific one-on-one -on -one level, I recently got into a very heated argument with, with a friend's father of mine. Um about just society, um, movements, engagement, Black Lives Matter. And it was difficult coming from a perspective of philosophy and logic and history with someone who was arguing about personal encounters. And at the end of the day, neither of us were willing to meet any kind of middle ground. And I, so I'm wondering how... I think everyone in this, to say, everyone in this Zoom call has taken effort to become more enlightened and more educated and, and study philosophy, history, economics, and everything else. How do we meet people who aren't willing to put effort into understanding these topics? And second, similarly related, you brought up that the pandemic has gotten more people thinking and more into philosophical themes. And you also brought up that leisure has brought up a rise in, in um, philosophical themes. Do you think people are more likely to engage in, in these conversations during leisure or times of peace than say during a crisis or times of urgency? Thank you very much. Those are excellent questions. So let me try and answer those, um, those uh, the, the, the latter two first. Um, now, yeah, I, I didn't say necessarily that the pandemic gives rise to, to, to more thinking. I, I don't think I said that. Um, I think the pandemic can be a provocation for a certain kind of thinking for those who are already in a sense doing it. Um, I think, yeah, so I, I'm not making any larger claims uh, than that. Um, and um, I think that the, the question uh, around leisure, so, you know, do people now 
think more because they have a, a bit more time on their hands or do they, you know, are they provoked into it by, by condition of, uh, of, of crisis? Um, right. Is that the, the, the sort of the, one of the questions you, you put, this was a yeah. kind of opposition you were opposing. Yeah. I mean, I would say that that's a bit of a false opposition, isn't it? That it's the crisis that gives us leisure to think. Um, and for, for some of us, that's a great thing. For others, it's it's a consignment to poverty or, or or homelessness. So there's a kind of class dimension to that, which has always afflicted philosophy. Right, the division of labor is central to the possibility of um, uh, of uh, 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 philosophizing. Right, there are, th there are those who must work in the fields, and there are those who, who get to be priests and later philosophers. And so there's a kind of division of labor uh, to begin with. So that that that's somewhat problematic but I think the larger question could be or, or the, the the question could be reformulated in terms of saying well um, is it a, 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 a time of peace that's more propitious to thinking or is it a time of war and I think that's a, a fascinating question I'm not sure I have a, an answer one would have to look at you know this on a uh, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis perhaps there's certain kinds of people who are more stimulated by conditions of peace and there are those who are more stimulated by uh, conditions of, of war, um, and, and I would leave it at that. I think the first question is really the, the most urgent one that I've heard so far, right? I mean, this is key. How can we actually engage with people um, when they're not necessarily willing uh, to, um, to think, but simply want to relate certain very circumscribed personal experiences as ways of making claims? Right and or as ways of justifying uh, claims and um, I mean I think this is uh, you know th this is the problem that dialectics addresses first and foremostly and this is what is meant by negativity that one has to move beyond the immediacy of one's direct experience to some kind of um, uh, uh, conceptual uh, uh, awareness and conceptual grasp of the situation, which ultimately entails some understanding of the whole, which you alluded to when you were talking about philosophy, history, and economics, and so on, right? Now, this is a kind of uh, opening to, a, a, like, a Frankfurt School 101, which, was, which is to say, Hegel thought that philosophy alone could grasp the absolute. Writing in the early part of the 20th century, Frankfurt School thinkers like Horkheimer, thought we need an interdisciplinary project so we can grasp the totality in its, um, its specificity using the most advanced methods of, of histories, you know, political economy, uh, psychology, psychoanalysis, and so on. But how do we deal with this in, a, you know, in, in the immediacy of, of the situation? I think this is extremely difficult. There's one answer that Adorno gives in his most recently published um, and, and translated lecture that he gave for the Austrian Students uh, um, Society um, in, in the 60s. Uh, he basically says that the, the place to go is to appeal to, um, say, supporters of the far right, appeal to their immediate interests, right? How do they understand their immediate interests and move the discussion from there into, um, you know, those questions of political economy, of history, uh, uh, of law, and so on. But I think that the last thing we want to be doing is, be, is, in a sense, dictating to people and saying, this is the right way. This is the way it is. This is how you ought to behave. And I think this is what we're seeing a lot of today in terms of identity politics. There's a lot of moralizing. And I think it exactly backfires. Right. So um, we have to allow people to speak. And in the process of a conversation, the conversation has to ideally I and mean, the conversation goes somewhere. Um, but it's. It's not easy. So thank you very much for those, those questions. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. You're next. Hi, thank you. Um, so you kind of, I think, have addressed this question in, in, in your response to the last one, but um, there, there may be more to say on it. So throughout your talk, I think that the question of, um, you know, what constitutes trauma was, uh, came up in different ways in different instances like birth, death, genocide, the direction of subject and object, and I think some some others that perhaps I've missed. Um, but in a general sense, if I understand you correctly, trauma is the formative irrevocable event and crisis 
is the moment of consolidated possibility for transformation, overcoming, repression, regression, continuance of trauma through various defensive defenses perhaps, but a moment of possibility through which trauma can be addressed. This general dynamic seems analogous on the level of society, of history, and of the individual. But where the analogy becomes a problem is in the treatment implications, meaning mm -hmm. we would be tasked differently uh, addressing trauma through crisis on the level of the individual mm -hmm. than we would on the level of society. So um, I'm wondering if you can speak to this a little bit, if does that actually pre present a problem to this dynamic? You know, if we, if we have, if we are tasked differently dealing with trauma through crises as moments of condensed possibility socially on a societal level, um, do we then have to look back, right, to the analogy to, okay, I'm, I'm getting a bit further from the point, no, but no, I'm no, good. Yeah. <laughs> wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. Thank you. That, that's an excellent question. And this is a perennial problem uh, for um, psychoanalysis, social psychology, and of course, the attempt to bring psychoanalysis into a kind of um, social theory. This is, this is a huge problem. And, and I think this is also why you know, the Frankfurt School figures uh, such as, uh, you know, Marcuse and, and, and Adorno, uh, Horkheimer, um, were quite skeptical of, of the therapeutic dimensions of psychoanalysis because it, it, it seemed to point in the direction of adjustment, right? An adjustment to, um, to an order that needed to be transformed. Um, so there's this kind of conservative dimension to psychoanalysis, right? Um, that Freud's, you know, Freud not only wanted to make people a little bit less unhappy, but also, you know, do so in the realms of work and love. And, and, and this is profoundly affirmative, you know, in, 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 in terms of um, not uh, um, putting, uh, outlining an agenda for social change, um, which means then, of course, you know, a, a kind of Sisyphean, you know, um, keeping in place the very sources of neuroses and, uh, and pathologies that psychoanalysis purports to, uh, to cure, right? So there's a kind of internal critique uh, there in, in, in the Frankfurt School. Um, but I, how can we try and do this? I think if, if we look at the, the problematic that Jeremy was, was suggesting um, of, the, of the possibility of revolution versus reform, uh, versus, versus uh, not reform, but restoration, right? The restoration after the revolution, um, perhaps, this might give us a way of understanding um, the problem of trauma. So I would define trauma, you know, the key definition is um, a rent or a tear, um, an undermining of the symbolic order, right? Um, we can think about this in Lacanian terms, the return of the real, or we can think about it in, in, in more prosaic Kuhnian terms, right? The, 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 uh, the paradigm no, is no longer available to us is no longer um, capable of explaining the anomalies that emerge in our attempts to grapple with, you know, the um, with with new empirical evidence. So we need a, a kind of revolutionary science that can better accommodate the, this this new um, uh, uh, data, new information, new findings. Right. So we can look at trauma as this rent or tear in the in the, in the symbolic order. Now I think societally, this then leads to an opening for a new way of doing things. You know, if we, we now see the, the neoliberal social order for what it is, um, there's no, uh, the, 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 there's absolutely no denying the various forms of inequity uh, and, and contradiction that are built into this ne uh, neoliberal order. It opens up the possibility uh, of a new way of organizing social relations, right? And, and at a global level, I think this is what, what the crisis, and you know, this is quite simplistic, but I think this is one of the, the ways in which an experience of trauma at a global level um, can function. Of course, it can also move in a very different direction. It can move in an extremely authoritarian and dictated, uh, dictatorial direction, but whether which way it goes is a function of politics. It's not, you know, uh, gonna be, um, uh, determined in advance, as I said, using that expression earlier. The restoration 
dimension might be more appropriate at the individual level. So you've you've gone through a trauma, you've been in a war situation, you've sexually abused, you've been you know you've been mugged and brutalized on the street. Um, your world has been shattered, right? Your trust in the social has been fundamentally destabilized. So what is the function then of therapy? Well, one, it would seem to me, one of the, the functions of therapy would be to reestablish a, um, a viable uh, connection um, to the, 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 the social whole. Um, the social bond would have to be reestablished. So it would be restoration in a sense, right? And that's precisely, that it gets me back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of adjustment and so on, right? Um, that, you know, one needs to be able to function within society as it's constituted. The other, what I was suggesting, you know, just a second ago, the, the other possibility of revolution is in the need for fundamental transformation of social relations. So you have a division of labor, but there's also a contradiction or a tension between these two, these two levels and two dimensions. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. This is a very yeah, good question. You. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we have two last people on the stack. I'm gonna close stack because we're about at the end time. So first Rachel and then Drake. Okay, hi. <laughs> Forgive me, hi. this is a silly question, but I think um, in terms of just like talking about rep the restoration, it's kind of related. It's kind of, I am someone who has nightmares about going outside without a mask on. It's like attached to my body now. And I can't imagine ever living my life going forward even without a mask on. While on the other hand, there are people that basically never wore a mask. So I, what I'm interested in about like trauma attached to this especially is what do you think is gonna happen? Are people going to just pretend that COVID never happened when it's like over? Or do you think that it's gonna like really affect our society and how we view hygiene and like just like how we live our lives, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense to me. I think this is a question that I think probably m many of us uh, ponder. Um, and I'm not sure I, I'm in a position to answer that question. These things are very difficult to, to anticipate uh, and to predict. Um, however, I think just, yeah, I mean, I think the traumatic nature of going out in the public sphere, being inside with others and so on, where that's possible. Uh, it's not possible here right now in BC. Uh, I, I think things have opened up in, a bit in New York. Um, uh, but uh, here, I'll give you one example. I, uh, early on in, the, in the, the pandemic, people would on, on, you know, on social media talk about watching a film and um, they would all of a sudden see a, a, be confronted with a scene where two people hugged each other. And there was this immediate sense of, oh, no, don't do that. You shouldn't be doing that, you know? So it's, it is in a sense, now that was early on. And now we're uh, over a year uh, beyond the, um, uh, the pandemic, um, the, the beginning of the pandemic. And so I, I think that that has sort of, it's, it's got to have imprinted upon us, um, uh, at least those of us who, who take these public health protocols very seriously. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably continue to do so uh, quite for quite some time after uh, the pandemic is, is, is over. Um, I'm hoping that in the me media, you know, medium term uh, after that, people will slowly get back to where they can actually, you know, feel comfortable hugging other people. I mean, this sort of, this, this immediacy of contact with others, shaking hands and, and, and hugging and, and kissing, um, uh, that's important. It was really important. So I hope we never lose that. But at the same time, it may be something, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm like Jeremy, I tend to be a little bit more on the pessimistic side, but um, maybe an optimistic uh, dimension of this could be that we are a little bit more aware of how, you know, how germs in general are spread. And maybe, you know, one of the things that we'll, uh, we'll see less of is, uh, is the flu, uh, because people will have better uh, personal hygiene. There'll be more um, uh, mindful of how they are negotiating public space um, and that will uh, perhaps lead to a diminution of the flu which as we know is is uh, itself um, uh, lethal but not to the same extent of course as, as COVID-19 that beyond beyond that I, I don't think I can I can really speculate and Drake <laughs> 
Hi, uh, Samir, thank you for, uh, for coming, for speaking, for, for coming here. Um, uh, I, I don't have a question so much as um, I think some comments and I, I think this is, it's a very interesting um, uh, opportunity to think about the, the traumatic effects um, of the coronavirus on, the, on the, the world's population, as well as, well, it's, it, I think there, there probably is a lot of material generate that, that generated for political philosophers or social philosophers within this. It's almost, it's almost a, a kind of interesting um, case study or experiment that I think it will probably take several years to really understand the implications of. Um, and if, if you had to sort of zero in on, on, on one of the, the sort of central political or ethical problem, I think, with the virus, it would be the sort of lack of a universalistic um, response, um, a lack of a sort of uh, real construction of a, of a social system that would prevent people from, from dying from what is, um, what is not exactly a particularly threatening disease. So I mean, so that's that, that's kind of what I what I wanted to say. Um, the the traumatic as it, the traumatic aspect of coronavirus is very confusing because it requires this this shutdown, this sort of unprecedented thing. But at the same time, it's 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 not it's not leprosy. It's not AIDS. You know, it's it's a it's a particularly bad yeah. Um, yeah. flu. It has it has a, a certain deadliness, but um, so it's it's a crisis that this is where I think it becomes very interesting for for political philosophy and, and interesting um, to sort of call in a, a thinker like Adorno. Uh, what what Jeremy said earlier about art allowing suffering to speak, uh, I think is is um, very apt for this because this is almost this is almost like a, a trauma that can't really be felt. It's a it's a social trauma. It's this sort of we can we can. We can see that our society is not is not solidaristic. It is not together. Um, but if it were a more extreme disease, then there almost certainly would be a more uh, solidaristic, let's say, or universalistic um, response. So there's, I, I think there there really is a a very interesting um, paradox there uh, that. I think could generate a lot of really interesting um, inquiry for um, for uh, for political philosophy in the future. Um, I don't know. I, I I have to bring this to a much more mundane register, which is that I just finished watching the QAnon documentary, which I actually do recommend to people. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but I I would agree with what Tom said in the in the chat. It's that it's not a it's not per se a lack of thinking. I think that um, it's that 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 leads to a sort of irrational anti-masking whatever anti-vax response i think it might perhaps be overthinking it's it's a kind of paranoid right. sort of attempt to to rationalize and 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 really really sort of master the problem from a very limited you know vernacular working man's standpoint you know QAnon is is social theory? It's a form of vernacular social theory in a way. So, so yeah, that was that was just kind of um, those are some thoughts I had. Um, response yeah. Here. Well, thank you. If I could just respond, um, I appreciate the comments very much. Uh, your last point, and uh, you know, also referring to Tom, um, I suppose uh, it, everything hinges on what you, what you mean by thinking uh, as well. Um, accepting a kind of ready-made um, uh, conspiracy theory may not qualify. Um, and I think here the work of Moshe Postone is quite interesting as well. And, you know, the, the, the understanding uh, of, yeah, finance, capital, um, abstract labor, and so on, that are in, in a way reified and, and, and um, isolated from the larger social whole gives you a kind of conspiratorial thinking, gives you a kind of, you know, uh, uh, initial... Uh, justification or initial, let's say, manifestation, not justification, but manifestation of, of anti-Semitism. Is this a real kind of uh, thinking um, or, 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 or not? I mean, I, I, 
I would think not, but again, it really then hinges on what you mean by thinking. Thinking must entail a degree of negativity, a degree of skepticism and a, a degree of, of um, uh, uh, literally negation in, in a determinate sense. So there are aspects of what you say that are true, but there are these other aspects that are false. And let's move from the, 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 the false to the true uh, and then realize that, that what, the truth of what you're saying actually is not a, a complete in and of itself, but requires these other propositions that we must also analyze and so on. Um, and maybe the, you know, the hypothetical situation that was presented uh, earlier uh, by the previous um, questioner could be returned to in the sense, and, and it's like, a, a, you know, it is a proper conversation and, and a dialectic through the dialogue. But if this is even possible is, is a big question now in our era of social media. And I think that the, the, the increasing preponderance of social media in our lives, Zoom as well, um, means that those kinds of, you know, one-on-one -on -one encounters where people can't just simply insult you and, and, uh, and, and run away, but must actually, you know, be accountable for the claims. Um, I think this is important, and this is part of the trauma and part of the crisis that, that, that we're living through. Um, I think that you might have a, a, a different position on the traumatic nature of the present as well. If, if you've been in an ICU or if your friends and family have been in ICU as opposed to understanding it, it, it abstractly. Here we have a difference between the abstract and the concrete. Again, important concepts of dialectical thinking. Um, the concrete is what's mediated, right? Thrown into relationships. Whereas the abstract is something that is outside of or separated from those relationships. So uh, the abstract and the concrete then can actually um, uh, present us with different views of, of how traumatic the trauma is, right? Um, but to your point, and I absolutely agree with this, in my uh, province here in, 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 in BC and in Vancouver, Vancouver actually has one of the poorest neighborhoods in the entire country, probably one of the poorest in North America. Um, of course, there's a lot of competition from your country, um, but what, what is uh, at issue here in, in the downtown east side, as it's called, which is just about two miles from where I live, uh, is a large indigenous uh, population, homeless people, uh, people who have severe addictions, um, uh, substance uh, abuse issues, um, and we have a fentanyl crisis that has, since the pandemic has begun, has dwarfed the deaths and the hospitalizations due to the pandemic. So here we see, in a negative sense, the systemic racism that's built into the non-response of the government to the opioid crisis or the fentanyl crisis and the way in which it has focused on the, this pandemic because it is uh, taken to be, you know, in a sense, um, the, the societal norm. This is what we must be focusing on. Um, one reason for that, of course, and this cannot be uh, um, for, uh, left out of the conversation, um, a key reason for this isn't the, 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 the levels of uh, mortality per se as the way in which um, the cases require intensive care treatment in hospitals. This is really key. It's about the overburdening of hospitals. So if hospitals are overburdened. If ICUs are overburdened and you break your ankle or worse, you have, you know, you're, you're in late stages of cancer and so on, you are in danger of not getting treatment, right? So it has all these larger reverberations, which we can understand if we understand things from the standpoint of the concrete. That is to say, what are the larger social relations here? Right? That is taking away hospital capacity for people who don't have COVID-19, right? But if we don't treat the people who do, then it's going to get worse and worse, and it'll spiral even further out of control. So it might not actually have a high rate of mortality attached to it, like three times that of the flu. Um, it's, it's implications for the system as a whole, the healthcare system as a whole. Now, just, I, I'll, I'll finish now, but an active imagination. You have a, a city in which the hospital system, the healthcare system is overburdened to the point of collapse. What happens then? What happens to the levels of social trust? What happens to the level of, uh, of, of social peace? One can imagine disturbances, civil unrest, riots, the police, the military, and a situation that worsens and gets further out of control. I think that is a very 
realistic scenario if this particular pandemic isn't brought uh, under control. Now, you're, you're hearing from somebody who's a lay person, but this is simply how I'm analyzing it. I'm at, you know, I'm, I, I've, I've got as many tools as, as all of you do, but this is how I'm trying to reconstruct the decisions of healthcare uh, um, experts and some of what they've said, of course, you know, but this is not something they're going to go out in public and talk about. But one can imagine the logic or one can, uh, you know, in a sense, arrive at the logic of what may happen if, if this thing spirals out of control. So that's why I think that the traumatic kernel here is, is very, very real uh, in that sense. But thanks so much, Drake. I appreciate the, the comments. Well, thank you, Samir. Uh, I think we should end for the evening um, and leave people to their victuals. Um, but thank you so much for joining us virtually. Um, yeah, a round of virtual applause. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's do it again sometime in viva voce. Uh, and again, thanks to Juliet um, for her stewardship. Uh, congratulations, Juliet. Um, and thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I will see you all in the fall. If I, if I could just also say thank you all for coming uh, and your, your wonderful comments and questions. I appreciate it very much. And thanks again, Jeremy and Julia. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.